Hello everyone, I am Brady Bridges and I'm the broker and owner of Reside Real Estate here in Fort Worth, Texas. I want to welcome you to another episode of Real Talk with Reside Real Estate. We are a top producing team here in Fort Worth, Texas, and we want this podcast to be a resource for anyone looking to learn more about real estate and the great city of Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Reside Real Estate. Today I'm joined by Mary Margaret Davis. She is the broker and owner at Mary Margaret Davis Real Estate Team. She acquired her real estate license in her hometown of Snyder, Texas at 20 years old and then further acquired her broker's license at 22. She moved to Fort Worth in 1988 and worked for new home builders until moving to the on-site sales team at the Texas and Pacific Lofts in downtown Fort Worth. Mary Margaret created her brokers in 2011 and continues to share her passion for urban real estate as she lists, sells, and consults on all types of real estate in Fort Worth and beyond. Mary Margaret, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. So I thought you would be a great person to talk to because... You're kind of the go-to person in town of uh, knowing what's going on in downtown Fort Worth, and you're pretty well-versed on knowing what's going on on the west side over by Camp Bowie and Arlington Heights. So with as many people that have been coming here and moving here and the growth and just urban living, I thought you'd be a great person to talk to. So kind of tell people a little more about yourself and how you got into real estate. Well, I, I didn't, I, when I was in my late teens, I went to a course in Tyler, Texas, which was a certificate to get all the skills to run a pro shop at a private club. So business accounting, accounting to mm-hmm. business machines, even at the time. So I went back to my hometown and created a tennis program on the three courts at the nine hole golf club. And I was 19 and I had made $19,000 in my first three months, got married when I was 18 and the the skills as far as the business courses that I took at the time related to real estate license. And so I, I was thinking, how can I bump up my income while it's snowing yeah. or raining? And so the, the real estate won out because of the capitalistic opportunity to make money. And so real estate won out and I sold all kinds of real estate in Snyder, small town, oil, oil town. We have higher I, uh, prices per square foot than Lubbock and Abilene. It's crazy. Yeah, my dad, uh, He's in the oil business and Patterson drilling. He was very good friends with the Pattersons, um, so I know a lot about Snyder. Yes, very. They, and their kids took tennis from me and the nephews and nieces. I did a lot of little kids and stuff. And but anyway, the segue into real estate was just perfect. So did that and then left Snyder when I was about almost twenty eight and. Thought I may want to live in Fort Worth or I might want to live in Virginia. I didn't know. So I went to work holding a broker's license I didn't need for new home builders. Okay. And that's very corporate, very structured. You can have days off if you want to, and everybody can come to your desk and see your file. Systems, systems, systems. Mm -hmm. Great training. Um, Principally worked for Perry Homes in southwest Fort Worth. And when the developer for the Texas and Pacific Lofts, decided to sell the condos rather than make them into apartments, which was their goal when they started and finished. Then they went looking for someone local that knew all the realtors, had a real estate license, and was an on-site specialist. And not very many realtors hold all those three things. Sure. And so a couple of calls later, they located me and... I, we sold all 228 condos in three years, and I took the formula from uh, suburban new home sales, the corporate formula, know your competition, know your product, know your community, and you become the go person. You're, you're the system. market expert, yeah. yeah. And we did spreadsheets that had all the HOA dues in every community at the time and still keep that pretty close. And it's a specialized product. We, When we sold out in 2010, I went to downtown Fort Worth, Inc. and told Andy Taft, at the time the president still is, that we didn't have a sales force because the suburban realtors had seen condos and townhomes in the 70s fail because they had to be built in unzoned areas. They didn't do well in resale. And that story no longer exists. Downtown, you know, the, the issues in the 70s, were not the same issues in 2010. Sure. So we ended up together creating a real estate course called Certified Urban Expert. And we've done it several times. We're about to pull it out again because realtors ask me almost every day, when are you going to do that course again? But we basically broke down the good, bad, and ugly of HOA dues, HOAs, and all mm-hmm. these. 
we explained what the dues go for compared to single family homes. We had a title company attorney come and talk about the good, bad, and the ugly of all kinds of HOAs and what you need to know and what you need to share with your clients. And the realtors came out of that rather than competing against Urban for something else they were more familiar with. They actually had a story to tell, and it really changed it, the the way suburban realtors interact with condos mm-hmm. and their clients. Um, I, I think that's a great yeah, that's a great to put that course together because I know, especially you know, as you're new getting into it, going to show a condo. You know, when I first started, I called you, and you're like, "You need to go do this. You need to go preview and this, find this stuff," because it's it's a whole different ball game. It is. Than just walking up and opening a, opening a door and letting them in. And in that course was the only course, it was a certification and MCE credit, but it's the only course in the nation where the suburban realtors are being educated by the urban-focused realtors. Mm-hmm. Why would they want to share? Well, if you have realtors and bankers and insurance people that don't know about condos, you'll have things happen like, Just this past week, a lender, we have a VA certification at the TNP. It's very rare to have Mm -hmm. FHA VA in Fort Worth right now. And he had asked for a termite inspection. And I said, you don't need a termite inspection on a high rise unless the condo touches the dirt. That would mean only in our new building, our building on the first floor. And uh, he didn't believe me, but he was willing to take it to his underwriter, who was the one asking for it. And sure enough, he came back and said, you're right. We don't need it in a high rise, only if it touches the ground. And so just insurance. Call to get an insurance quote, and they say, "There's there are six claims in that building. And I'm like, did you put the condo number in there? We have 136 condos in that yeah. building. So things like that, you learn a lot of times I've learned just over time, you're driving the car. Nice. And if you're not driving the car, you don't know where you're going. So, so when did you split off from being in-house sales to kind of running your own own team now? Well, we sold out at the TNP building in 2010, January of 2010. And I interviewed with David Weekly. I was hired by Highland Homes mm-hmm. in North McKinney, and I live in southwest Fort Worth. Yeah, it's called a drive. And I, on the way back, I saw a fork in my windshield that said, I don't need to do the new home sales anymore. That door's closed. So my husband, Grant, just said, why don't you do your own thing? You have a broker's license. And I walked into a very lucrative brokerage just from having the urban focus Mm -hmm. and had all the listings at the building that I sold and then lots of other referrals coming my way. Those condo owners also referred me to maybe a 21-acre a piece of land in Navarro County, you know, or they own a country home. They want to sell that. So it's just... It was just a perfect fit. Well, I think I think it's great because I'm sure, and it, some of this is still true, but people that are buying condos, they're typically it's not always a primary, right? So there was a lot of opportunity for you with people with second homes, their high net worth, typically. Yes. So more deals come, and one of the things that I feel like you're really strong at is maintaining relationships. I mean, not only with just other agents in town, you're always welcoming to share advice, but. I imagine you pass that on with your clients, and it's it's just led to continuous referrals over and over for you. And the, the fact of plenty rather than the theory of lack mm-hmm. always makes a difference. If you're generous with people, then they remember you. Even Absolutely. Even if you didn't have anything to do with that transaction you helped them on, you they remember you doing that and say, you, you might want to call Mary Margaret. And so that works out. Real, 60% of my business is referral. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so... For someone that's listening that they know nothing about condos, they know nothing about what is the big difference of buying a single family home versus buying a condo? Largely, it's people that want to reduce their time that they spend maintaining a home. They don't want a second and third job. They want to travel They basically want to maybe reduce their carbon footprint from two cars to one. Mm -hmm. They're looking at the lock and leave so they can travel. Um, Sometimes it's empty nesters that have already done all that. You know, there's a book that talks about being captive to the American dream, where you start young in an apartment, then you get your house, it's a two-bedroom house, three-bedroom house, whatever, your boat, your vacation home, whatever, and then you end up being actually captive to the dream that you mm-hmm. went after. 
And so there are young people now that have watched their parents do that. And they're like, oh, I don't think I want to do that. Or there are people that are empty nesters and they're like, okay, we want to do something totally different. And so comparing if you have a buyer client and they want to consider either, you have another factor that comes in. And that is if you have a client that doesn't know for sure, maybe they want to lease for a year. You know, I've made 30, 35,000 a year in, in lease fees really? and most realtors won't even mess with it. But in that course, I say, if you don't take as much time to know the apartment market and the lease condos and houses as you do about the for sale, well, you're going to miss 50% of the urban demographic because they're going to want to see if they like it first. Sure. And then if they love it, which most of them do, then they'll be your client when they buy. It's very interesting. Yeah. I, you know, a lot of times, especially in my mind, I don't handle leasing most of the time just because one, it can be it's a bit more of a grind when you're going through leasing, but I didn't think about it for the fact if it's downtown type people, they're probably doing that just to try it out and then end up buying something later. Or a young attorney that just started working downtown and he's having to move really fast and he needs a place to live and he wants to buy, but he's, he's got student loans, you know, all those things. And, but he's a definite buyer in the future. So how do you, you know, in the past, Three or four years, we've seen a ton of townhomes pop up too. How has that affected the condo side of things? Like actual downtown Fort Worth, when you have all these con these townhomes that are also being built, just kind of right in the outskirts. Well, back when we started educating the realtors in 2010, the average realtor age was in the 60s, maybe close to 70. Okay. And that's totally shifted now. It's a lot of new, younger agents and things. Well, the older agents didn't get the town home with the three stories in the rooftop deck. That was just totally off. Yeah. They wouldn't even, if we toured, they'd stay in the bus. You know, it's just not going to work. Nobody's going to do this. And uh, now that whole conversation has shifted. Even Perry Holmes years ago brought in a town home product in Arlington Heights. Mm -hmm. And it was well before. Yeah, right on Dexter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Lowe's in Monticello and everywhere. They had. They built a townhome project, which is now right below our new city hall, um, Roundstone. Yeah. And that was a Perry Homes way okay. before it was cool to be in urban. And just to have that insight, we're really early on. But as far as, I guess, you know, there's no ownership townhome. It's single family attached. Mm -hmm. And there may be an HOA, but maybe all it does is take care of the yard. Okay. So the people that don't mind the stairs, and there's a bunch of people that are live that way and want to live that way, um, there are fewer restrictions mortgage-wise in planning in the HOA structure for owning a single-family attached home where you own the dirt and the air above. Um, and so sometimes it's easier to build for developers. I think right now it's much easier to build than condos because we don't have any new condos coming, which is sad. I, it's, that's half of my business, you know. We need to have more condos under development. It's all apartments. Mm -hmm. And the main reason, it may be the same developer. They want to do something that they can build, do the punch list, turn it to a management company or sell it, and they're out. In a condo, they have to stay on the board till 70%, 75% sold out. They have to stay responsible where that final punch list, like a new home, yeah. happens 10 years in when you have 300, 400 different owners. And it's there's just not enough margin in the, in the building process at this time. I'd be curious if private equity is a big piece of that because so much money now, you know, you've got these syndicated deals where people, you know, they'll go, I mean, you've, I'm sure you've seen some of them come across, but people will go, you invest two hundred fifty thousand dollars with a group of people. They go put it in an apartment complex, five year exit plan, and flip it. That's true. And you know the depending on what kind of financing they get as to how long they have to stay yeah. invested. But it's a very very similar sim, similar formula. The only difference is the liability is longer on a condo. So I'm hoping that as these big condos coming. In downtown and West Seventh, where the price per square foot is what three sixty four dollars a square foot. When we start seeing that demographic absorbing that product, then that's the same demographic that would buy a condo with a higher profit margin than we're seeing right now. Interesting. So, lots of conversation in the back. I think um, 
have they put any in, you know, like all the South Main stuff? Is that all? There's some condos over there, aren't there? There's a few condos. Yeah, I, I think. One on Galveston that went, came out right at COVID. Yeah. And they're selling, but it's a little bit different. Um, maybe someone bought a whole building of the four that yeah, yeah, yeah. or something. So it's a little bit different demographic. So you, during COVID, this is a question that I think is interesting. During COVID, did you see like an exodus from people getting out of downtown in the condos just from fear? I mean, Fort Worth obviously was a little different than a lot of areas, but... Um, what did you see through that time period? Well, the fear was mostly in my head more than the numbers. Yeah. But I really thought everybody was going to move to the country. And, of course, they did some things in downtown during COVID, like they turned the convention center into a homeless shelter, for mm -hmm. example. You know, we we have a, um, you know, urban is a little different in that conversation and how we want to we wanna be sure everybody's taken care of. Sure. But we want to not see it on our streets, you know, and so that was a concern. And of course that's all passed now and there's less inventory in all of Fort Worth Urban than in my history since two thousand six. Really? It's it's I mean, there may be three listings in the T N P building and there may be four or five in all of Dow. I mean it's and they're selling really fast, so the prices are kicking up and there's nothing to replace the product. So one thing that I you know, I've, I've talked to you about some when we've had them, like in Montgomery Plaza, things like that. Kind of explain the difference if you're a seller and, and also a tough for a buyer. You know, we've talked about this where you can't expect to see these massive price drops in condos. Like condo units don't, whenever price is set, it's, it, if it moves, it's very slowly in very small increments. So yeah. can you kind of explain why that is? Yeah, and there's an exception that I'll go back to, but, you know, it's just you have you have your appraisers go back three, six months, whatever. Right. And, you know, you can't have a condo that's 50000 more, for example, than everything else in the market because there's all this proof of other condos that are almost exactly the same. Yeah. So, yes, you will you don't see the same thing. You know, you might see if you have six of the same floor plan where you'll see the low-hanging fruit sell mm -hmm. and then, you know, they'll work on up. You can test a market and see if you can go thirty, forty thousand 40000 over and if if you have a seller that says that's my price, then I've given it a shot. And on occasion, you know, then they're like, "Well, where are the offers then?" And I'm like, "Well, they're if, they're a little bit lower price." <laughs> yeah, the offers aren't coming to us; they're coming to the condos that are listed more in the realm of normal. Um, so you're not gonna. I mean, we do see offers from buyers. I do on my listings all the time, where they just say, "Well, why don't we just offer twenty thousand less?" Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time proving the value that I have set if there's, you know, if there's a value there, which usually there is on occasion. I, I take one that's over market. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it sells somewhere in between the, the mean and the high. And so sometimes we get lucky, but not that much. We did have the exception would be when we were selling out in 2009 at the Texas and Pacific Lofts. The developer said, what should, what do you need to sell these 80-something condos this year? And we were in a recession. So we did some sellout incentives, and we furnished five or six condos because the empty nesters that came in the beginning knew the history of the area. They wanted to live there. They'd been following the project. So they, it could be a vacant, concrete-looking space, urban space, and they're like, I want that one. And then we had the relocating people that came from the urban markets and yep. they wanted the train. They wanted whatever they wanted there. They weren't picky about which building. We had two buildings. And they were, we 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 want this. They didn't have to see furnished models. And then the next big demographic toward the end was the young professionals that had grown up in model home world. Yeah, They didn't quite get the industrial look and whatever. And they didn't get the empty concrete space. And so when we furnished those, those people bought. Yeah. The, we had a dip in our prices in the in the resale market in the very beginning of that after we sold out. And the people that sold, very few people had to leave because they were a higher end demographic mm -hmm. income. There were a few foreclosures. Most of them were people that this was a second home, and if they had to sell in a dip, they, they lost money. Do the foreclosures on a building affect anything else that's happening? I mean, is it just going to be unique to those specific units just like it would a house? But like if you see multiple foreclosures in a condo, 
association? Does it trigger anything? It can, but it would have to be pretty severe mm-hmm. to, to have Yeah, I mean, that just yeah. that's my random it thoughts as things come up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have... That'd be a very bad situation yeah. if we saw multiple foreclosures. I yeah. Think. And over that period of three or four years that, that, that we were building the prices back up, I was in the resale market. Um, I think it was a total of 11 of 228 condos spread over three or four years. So it wasn't too bad, but, um, but the prices did recover. The people that waited are doing fine. You know, the challenges, if you have too many, too much commercial space back to the rules, Mm -hmm. or if you have too many rentals, you know, so they have to, as a, as a HOA community, they have to keep those numbers right. So I'm sure this is a question we get all the time for people like when they they're looking for condos that everybody wants to i want to buy a condo and i want to use it as a short-term rental well it's even more strict in the hoa requirement than it is in the city um i just think people don't people just don't understand i feel like everybody you know when i had that one in montgomery it everybody's like i want i think i want to buy this and use it as short-term rental but you just can't do it yeah it's in the guidelines they don't want transient moving in and out and mm-hmm. it, it, it wears out the elevators it's um it's it's a decision that was made by the group that we don't want that and they just basically they uh set it up in the rules that way there are townhome communities mm-hmm. that also restrict them but otherwise if they don't then it would fall under the city of fort worth guidelines so once the city passed those did you see anybody because i'm sure people still skirted it right they were mm-hmm. So, During the Super Bowl, for example, I had two dozen people ask me if I would lease their condo out to people who were just going to be there for two weeks or whatever. And I can't do that because I was, you know, I, I had to follow the rules. Well, yeah, especially you're in those buildings all the time. You don't want to get reputation with the HOAs, things like that. stay on the good side of all of that conversation. So what are the rules about if you want to buy a condo and it be a lease property? Are there regulations of how long you have to live there or... Like restrictions on there's uh, different communities have different restrictions. There's one building in downtown where you have to own it a year before you can lease it out, which basically would eliminate any true investor. Yeah, um, they'll have a cap on how many there can be. If you're an investor and you want a condo and you're wanting to look at the numbers of the return on the investment, then you know some of the resale leases. They haven't gone gone as high as some of the apartment prices, and so there's still they, those numbers need to kick up a little bit. But you've got probably, I think, usually a twenty five to thirty percent cap in some buildings that police it very closely for mortgage reasons. Mm-hmm. But um, most of the investors, I think, at least in the past few years, are accidental investors. They got relocated. They decided they'd keep it yeah. and lease it out because they might come back. Or they bought it four years in advance till their last kid gets out of school, and then they'll move into the lifestyle. So there's always a way to do that. If there's no room, if I have a listing um, in the tower and an investor buys it, then the there hasn't been any recent restrictions on whether or not it can be a lease unit if it was owned by an individual and turned into a lease Montgomery Plaza, you know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of strictness in a lot of those communities on whether someone can buy it as an investment property, but some of them are stricter. So outside of condos, because I don't want, I don't want people to think that's all you do. Like you do a a tremendous amount of business outside in just the residential single family space as well. I do. And it, you know, the having built hundreds of homes in Southwest Fort Worth, that's a built in referral source. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people saw me downtown and thought that I was not going to do anything but downtown. Oh, I only thought you sold condos. Yeah, I only so you should have called me. Yeah. And they listed with somebody else because they thought that was not my thing. So um, just trying to remind people that I have a, a, a vast experience in all different types of property, building, helping people build, helping people sell their resale home to move into a condo or vice versa. We yeah. have some people now moving out of a condo and moving to Granbury, I have a lot of business in Pecan Plantation, and I've sold in all those areas mm-hmm. out there, the Retreat and Klebert. And those were all clients that built Perry Homes with me back in 1995 or whatever. So yeah. you just have to stay at the top of their mind that you're still doing it and you're out in the 
the su- suburbs, and we do have a geographical uh, knowledge in our realtor mm-hmm. uh, code of ethics where you're bound to know. And I'm glad they've gotten a lot more strict about it, which yeah. I'm glad. People yeah. need to be competent. That's true, and especially when we're in an HOA conversation and things like that, like in the gone plantation. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not familiar, you're going to need to take a real good and hard look at all of that if you're willing to do business out there, which is what I've done just to help some sellers. And sure, now I've got buyers going out there. So, I guess that kind of this kind of leads into condos and all that. But how important is it for? one, your agent, and you as a buyer to go through the condo association rules, financials? Is that something that you really need to dig into? You really do, and you need to really know how to, what you're reading. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't, and they don't consider urban a a, a geographic zone. And I would think, not that I mind teaching suburban agents how to do it, but it's not easy I mean, I could sell something in Rockwall a lot easier than I could sell a condo if I don't know about it. Um, but you really need to take some courses or talk with the title attorney or talk with Mary Margaret about what you need to look for. You need to look for these percentages. You need to see the resale certificate. You need to see if there's any major lawsuits, minor, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to make sure that, you know, even a lender would be really helpful in getting with them and having them vet the condominium just to be sure you can do what it is that you want to do. Mm-hmm. But the bylaws, looking at the budget, looking at the balance sheet, going through the rules and regulations. Um, <clears throat> so you really need to educate yourself and your buyer on how all that works. And, you know, it helps to have done business there. It helps to have driven that car. You know? Yeah. Because it's you don't you don't you just have to keep updated, but you don't have to relearn it all if you've already sold in that property. So. Yeah, I mean, just familiarity with what you're dealing in is is huge. I think it's, I know, like you don't want to be put in a box, but the like having that niche piece of business is is a really good thing. I mean, you know it. People are coming to you with it. You kind of know what's going on in every single building before most people even some of the tenants, some of the people that live there actually do. True. I'm, I'm, you know, to have been there and from the ground up and know the entire history is really helpful. But, you know, you we we share information. The just that certified urban expert course, knowing that some of the top urban agents were actually there to facilitate pieces of the course and stuff. So those suburban agents who some were top agents in Fort Worth and had never sold a condo mm-hmm. would. Uh, would run a thing that shows here's a single family and all your your expenses and here's a condo with your HOA dues and this is how you explain why HOA dues are not as outstanding on top of it is instead of other expenses that you have. That's a good way to look at home. it. Yeah. And the formula I showed this group and say this all the time, one of the very top Fort Worth agents raises her hand. This was 2010, the first time we taught it, but... And I didn't coach her. She did it on her no. own. But she said, are you kidding me? I pay 2000 a year in my homeowner's insurance, and I'm only going to have to pay 500 for a condo. So when you start seeing where you're... Yeah, actually comparing the compared, cost. Yeah, then you'll see that you're still making money living in a condo with HOA dues. But, you know, of course, insurance costs have gone up, and the 2000s now 3000 and the condo amount is more like 800000 a year. Yeah. And so, but, um, but that... Knowing what the dues are, knowing what's included, well, yeah, I mean, teaching it, your buyers. If you're if you're going into it with a price, and then you're not aware of what the additional fees might be, mm-hmm. you're you really can one put your you know, put your foot in your own mouth. Be like, yeah. hey, this is actually going to put you way over your monthly budget than you wanted to be. Or, well, it's kind of like the buy down, the temporary buy downs right now yeah. that you used to be able to qualify on that first year reduced fee, mm-hmm. reduced payment. Now you still have to qualify for the higher amount. Um, which doesn't really, necess- it's not a bad thing, but it might not get every buyer. But when you're looking at what you're paying for your mortgage and your insurance and taxes, the HOA dues, um, you know, the, even though they're replacing other utilities and things like that, the lender doesn't feel that way. So you do have to qualify for yeah. those dues. 
And then you can, in your mind, subtract them out for, okay, I don't have 2400 a year in yard maintenance. I don't have a gas bill most of sure. the time. I don't have a fitness center bill. You know, all the things you don't have. But the lenders don't see it that yeah. way. So you still have to qualify. So one question that we get all the, that we run into, you know, the warrantable, warrantable versus non-warrantable. Can you explain that? Yes. So most of the lenders traditional lenders are reselling their loans to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And those are government supported um, that buy big yeah, loans yeah. and big packages. So Fannie Mae, just use them as an example, has a box that a condo regime has to fit in. That box says you can't have over 80 something, um, 28% commercial space. You can't have more than this many rentals. You can't have um, a budget below a certain amount and reserves below a certain amount. So this box includes all these things. And if you fit the box as a condominium regime, then you're warrantable. If you don't fit the box, it has nothing to do like the car sticker that says non-warranted, mm-hmm. not warranted. It just means that you don't fit the Fannie Freddie box. All that means to you as a buyer or a buyer's agent or a listing agent is you need to find a lender that does non-warrantable condos, and there are plenty out there. Another reason maybe to reach out to me and ask. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the most of them in our market are considered warrantable, but there are lenders that have created a product, and the investors want that buyer, and they've created a, a, a product that where you fall out of the Fannie and Freddie box because they're not selling to Freddie Freddy and Fannie. Mm-hmm. So. So you've been in Fort Worth a really long time doing real estate. Yeah. You've seen a lot of different markets. So, you know, one of the concerns I think a lot of people have right now is, you know, high interest rates. They're worried about what's going to happen with the market. Just, I mean, you've seen, you've seen some of the lowest to lows of real estate and the highest to highs. Like what kind of, kind of talk about the changes you've seen in your career in Fort Worth and where do you think things are kind of headed? Well, um, I did an informal poll on my years in the business. When I was 20, interest rates in 1980, interest rates were 18% when I started selling real estate. And I was still selling even amidst all that. Um, Over the years, I remember when I was at Perry Homes, at a point, people would want to offer 10,000 less or when we didn't negotiate. Interest rates were 10%. And I remember saying, would you let this beautiful home walk away for $87 a month. And then when rates went down to five, four, that was half of that mm-hmm. per, you know, for a $10,000 amount of money. And over those years, I've done an a informal poll and on average interest rates have been at nine to 10% in my years of being in business. So I think we need to guard as a realtor community and a community at large is telling people they'd be stupid to buy a house at 7% interest and that it's going to go down and it may or it may not go down. But I I mean, it could be 13. Mm -hmm. It could be nine. There there are ways in which you can still buy and people will still buy. But if going in, the realtors have that blinder on that says, well, I don't really see any sense in coming in today because why should I sell anything with the rates this high? We really need to guard against our own minds and just sever sever the past because the buyers are out are in the market. Mm-hmm. They're wanting to buy. And if you have under whatever peer pressure you, you hold as a community, you need to let people do what they want to do and they'll find a way to do it. Mm-hmm. And just don't be negative. Yeah, I think mindset's huge right now, especially, I mean, you you have a good perspective on that because you've been in the business a long time. You know, I I got my license in 2007. I wasn't actively using it at the time, but then like 08 was not really great for real estate at all. But since then, since I've really started using my license, like everything's kind of been on the uptick, right? Everything's been good. So like my, when I really started using it was 2014 and rates, I think were like in the mid fives mm-hmm. and that was fine. And you have agents that have started in the past few years, like got into it with the ride and the wave of COVID and everything else. And they saw two and 3%. They're, they're freaking out. Yeah. They're worried that things won't happen. And there are lots of factors that go into whether you're going to make it in the real estate business or not. But 
I think the main thing is keep your head down and keep working and looking for the business. You have to become like one of the things I love about you, you're a knowledge broker. You you know what's going on, you know your market, you keep up to date, and that's that's what we try to train. You didn't have to do that the past few years. I mean, it was really like list price was starting bed. You just, that's that's all it was. There wasn't negotiation. There wasn't getting creative. There wasn't, now you need to really hone in on your skills as an agent and figure out how to go talk to people, how to find ways to help people and make those moves happen, even if it's not an ideal situation. Yeah, and just, just learn and learn and learn. I mean, maybe you don't have a client every day of the week, so why aren't you taking a four-hour course on mm -hmm. uh, buy-downs or... We are having some FHA VA assumable product back because people bought a couple of years ago. Their equity's not that great, and they can do an assumable FHA or VA loan. And none of us, if we haven't been doing this for 100 years, none of us even know what that means. And plus, it used to be the prices were going up so high that the equity on an assumption would be so large. But now, if it's been a pretty short period of time, there's some value out there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I think... I think that's the best advice you can give an agent right now is just learn, learn. And, and become a knowledge broker. Learn about whether to tell your seller to reduce the price, build in a 2-1 buy-down, build mm -hmm. in a reduced permanent reduction in the interest rate. You know. Are you working with mainly listing side right now? I do both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so kind of what are some of the mistakes going back to like the actual process when you're going through and working with someone, where are you... What are you advising people on of the mistakes or the mistakes you're seeing them make when they're going into buying a condo? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a condo, but I'd like to know what you think about condos and where you see people make mistakes on the home buying side. Well, if you don't have a lender even that has uh, is experienced in the in the process, they they may not have loaded some of the upfront fees. Maybe you have a month and a half or two months of dues going into the capital reserves. Mm -hmm. And the buyer should know about that, but the lender doesn't know about it. So it doesn't go on their initial estimate. It doesn't kick it out for any reason. And they show up, they see their closing statement two days before closing or three, and it's considerably more than their lender had told them. And so... All of that should be things that the buyers are aware of, and, and all of that is about expectation. Mistakes that people have made, they made an assumption, and no one told them any different, that they were going to have two reserved parking spaces, and they're not reserved. And if you knew that up front, that's the lifestyle you've chosen. You don't have a problem with it. But if you learn about it after you move in, I think it's a little bit late. Yeah. Um, all of the logistics to get from looking, choosing, mortgage and whether it's um, even in uh, the tax exemptions we've had situations I've had situations where the buyer had a uh, partial disability veteran disability mm. was over 65 and their out-of-state lender used that reduced amount for their tax escrow tax and by the time we got to the point where we were getting ready to start really working the numbers the and this doesn't happen anymore because I make sure it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But the the buyer didn't qualify their full tax rate, and the lender wasn't in Texas, and that loan officer didn't have it at their in their head that that tax amount was considerably less than it should have been. Oh, and that's a big one. And yeah. you know, if I have the listing and I have an over sixty five person that has a partial dis seventy percent disability or whatever, or even just over sixty five. From the get-go, everybody that needs to know needs yeah, to know. Yeah, you let them know up front, like, yeah. hey, this is not the tax rate. They have these exemptions. Yeah. Or if the, if the seller's going to take those exemptions that year, then otherwise the buyer gets advantage of it for that year. But otherwise, I mean, we've got to train people what they're taught to look for. Yeah, it kind of reminds me on, like, new construction homes, how you have to tell people, like, hey, the tax rate that it's at now is not the number. It's going to go way up. So if you want it to be the number now, you need to tell your lender – right now because you're going to get a big surprise yeah and you don't get that big surprise until you're what past almost two years yeah ago. and then you get hit from what you owe and you get hit about a six or seven hundred dollar increase in your and payment it's, it's a lot of people that was one of the things when i was on site even at the condos that i would tell people okay it may look like eighty dollars a month but it's really going to be more like five six hundred mm -hmm. so you need to either budget for that 
don't forget I told you, you know, because you're going to, you're going to get here. Yeah. You're going to open up that shortage in escrow. Yeah. Um, so this has all been really great information. I think, I think there is a big demand. Like we see a lot of people and, you know, on our analytics, on our website, condos are one of the most searched things right now. That's great. Uh, so what is kind of your outlook for the condo market in Fort Worth going forward? Since, think, since you said not, like there's really not any new construction, right? So I think that's going to be the problem is inventory. Um, and we don't necessarily fit like maybe in New York City mm -hmm. where you have to drive or take public transportation three hours out of Manhattan to get to anything yeah. halfway affordable. So the people buying condos might be the young professional. I think we might not have as many opportunities for the first time buyer or young professional buyer in the condo market because once we see those margins improve the with the apartment rents going up and up and up, we won't see developers coming back into this market, though they are coming back in other markets. But mm. maybe we need some of these real estate investor groups to build some more condos. Spend more time in the conversation about condos. I do consult with some. But again, those the margins aren't big enough to build in insurance to protect them for that 10 years out punch list, things like that, that are expensive. And there's just not enough margin right now. Are you seeing any of the little outskirt cities like, you know, like there's there's been some, um, you know, obviously downtown is a big driver of a lot of those big buildings. But are you seeing it's kind of like little micro uh, condominium units popping up like, you know, Mansfield's grown a ton. Some of these little outskirts, are you seeing any of that happening? Yeah, um, I have a website called fortworthcondomania.com that's manned by somebody else, but I'm mm -hmm. the person. Yeah. And it's all townhomes and condos in, in Tarrant County. Okay. And you see a lot of stuff in South Lake. You'll see stuff, Flower Mound, um, near some of the Wilt, some water. You see some of that out in the kind of the vacation areas yeah. in Granbury and around uh, like I could see that being a huge market in South Lake because yeah. if you go by if you're trying to buy a house out there you're not getting anything for less than a million too yeah that's true and so I'm sure the condos the aren't condos cheaper are pretty, though <laughs> pretty high too but yeah there's there's definitely some some markets and then you'll have some over 65 product over 55 product over 62 product and they want maybe they there's some out in Tavolo where they have their little bitty tiny garden mm -hmm. homes. And but they have their yeah own, in Ladera then the Ladera and there's one of those in Mansfield too so you know, that product's really cool and of course we need to keep people buying we need to keep things affordable enough to where we have a say in our homestead exemptions mm -hmm. and home ownership rights and if everybody becomes a renter it's gonna hurt us all and yeah. so we need to keep things moving forward in home ownership as best we can. Yeah, I think that's great. So kind of the last two things I want to ask you, what is like what is the best piece of advice you would give to a potential home buyer or condo buyer moving into Fort Worth? Because a ton of people are coming from out of state. So what's your number one piece of advice you give a buyer coming here? Well, it depends on the buyer. We have a lot of buyers that have been in a much higher market, uh, overall real estate price mm -hmm. market. So they think they have to come comparable to that into Fort Worth. So maybe they need to spend half that. Maybe they need to understand that our tax base is a little bit different on property tax. So they'll know, okay, I need to I need to put some of my dollars in since we don't have other types of taxes, mm -hmm. but our property taxes are pretty high. Yeah, that always seems to be a shell shock yeah. for people. And if you have if you have a two million dollar home in California, that's probably a maybe a six seven hundred thousand dollar home mm -hmm. in our market so educating them that they're not going to have a, a, a property uh, income tax hit if they buy a lower price property anymore that rule changed years ago which really helped Fort Worth and then just know that most of the national negative news is only helping our market because we have everything so much better than anywhere else in the United States. Absolutely. Even in most other cities in Texas. So when things start, when the, when those interest rates went down, it was because the national news was bad. It wasn't, our news wasn't so bad here. And so, you know, it doesn't hurt anybody to have 
some unrest in our market because Fort Worth always comes on comes back on top. Awesome. And if if the total sky falls, then it's going to fall for all of us. And so just try to stay positive, find what fits, and live your life. And yeah. if the sky falls, you know, if something happens to our market, I remember being told when I was worried when we went through the dip and I was opening my brokerage and the prices weren't where they were on the condos when I sold them. Mm-hmm. I had a Lockheed Martin engineer say, well, Mary Margaret, you are responsible for the entire world economy, right? And so we as realtors need to know that buyers are going to need us, sellers are going to need us, even if there's been a dip or if there's been an improvement or whatever, we just need to be there when they need us. I love that you say that because you have the right mindset that you're approaching those people with value. Mm -hmm. You know you have something to offer and a way to help them. So I think think that's what... I think that's a great tip for all agents. Find ways to be of value to your clients. Yes, definitely. So the last question I ask everybody is, what do you love about the city of Fort Worth? Oh, um, I love the energy. I love that there's always something new happening. I love that it's a friendly place. Um, you know, pre-COVID, I remember moving to a big city when I moved this direction and people wouldn't look me in the face. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to a restaurant late because I work late and people at the bar were turning around and they had these beautiful orange frozen drinks. And I said, that's pretty. What's that? And the husband said, it's a mango margarita. Want to taste? You know, you can't get people to look in the eye in one city and the next time you're in Fort Worth, people are letting you drink out of their glass. Of course, that that was before we had COVID. But even so, people are like, well, this is where the West begins. Yeah. People are, will speak with you. They will look you in the eye. They will. Um, there's a level of trust here, and um, it's it's my roots. It's it feels like my small town Snyder that I grew up in. It's it's funny. Everybody that I've had in here has had some very similar thing. Like I've had a lot of West Texas people in. It, it feels like Midland. It feels like Lubbock. It feels like I. It's great, and I I think we're very blessed. And a good point you made earlier about the national media housing market it's not the same here it's not the same and we have some very generous and wonderful we have some very wealthy benefactors the people that put a lot into fort worth and trying to continue to main, maintain what it is and continue to invest so yeah i think we're trying we're, to keep our culture we are, we still want to be you know the western city mm-hmm. we're not trying to turn into something we're not we, yeah we know who we are yeah we know who we are well, Mary Margaret, I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, if somebody wants to get a hold of you or ask more questions, how can they reach you? Um, my cell number is 817-925-1740. And I'm Mary Margaret Davis at mmdavis.com. Well, this was very great. I think it's going to help a lot of people, especially um, hopefully some agents will listen to this and know to call you when they have questions about the condo side of things. But I appreciate it. This was another episode of Real Talk with Reside Real Estate. If we can be a resource of any kind, please reach out.